Good morning, Eastridge. It's wonderful to see everybody. Now, whether we are here in person or we are online, let's stand together and we are going to sing and worship God this morning.
to worship you today in a time where not everyone has this privilege and honor and father we ask as the message is brought this morning as communion is is done this morning that you prepare our hearts and our minds for what you have in store for us in Jesus name we pray amen amen you may be seated um, we are going to be celebrating communion in just a few moments' time, and uh, there were some uh, little prepackaged things on your way, and hopefully you grabbed it. If not, now is your chance. As you can see, things look back to normal around here, aside from the exhaustion levels of our leaders being quite substantially higher than they were last week. This past week, we had uh, the chance to complete our vacation Bible camp program. We had just over 40 kids uh, celebrate through the week, join in crafts, activities, and hear the gospel message of Christ. It was an amazing opportunity, and we'd like to thank each and every one of you who contributed, who contributed in prayer, in uh, resourcing of materials, uh, in prepping some of those required resources ahead of time, and a big special thank you to all the volunteers. Uh, so what I'd love to do is just give a round of applause, whether they see this online, just to show, uh, once again, our unending appreciation. 
And uh, I was chatting with uh, Katie yesterday as we are planning ahead for our August camp. And if in the bottom of your heart you're thinking right now, oh, I missed out. There is still time to get you in for the August camp as a volunteer. Uh, and the August camp at this point, I believe, is capped at 50 at this point because the registration is even higher for the next one. So we'd ask you to uh, prayerfully consider that. Um, this morning we're going to have the opportunity to pray for our giving as well. Uh, here at Eastridge there are a number of different ways to give. Uh, givings can be done online through our website. Uh, they can be done via e-transfer, which I always find is the most quick and convenient. Um, offerings can be mailed in and as well they can be uh, contributed on Sunday mornings. So before we uh, celebrate communion, let's just take a minute. We are going to bow our heads and uh, pray and ask God to uh, bless that for us this morning. Dear Father God, you are the king of all. You are a wonderful and mighty counselor with a, with a plan that is active and moving. Lord, this morning we come to you and we give of ourselves. Lord, we ask that uh, you would just... Lean into our hearts the message that you would have for us as uh, we explore the life of Nehemiah and what it looks like building bridges into your future. Lord, we thank you for this time and lay these gifts at your feet, lay our hearts at your feet, lay our minds into your hands uh, for your guidance and for your glory. In your name we pray, amen. Now, as we gather at the table, we have the opportunity to remember uh, just how much foresight the Lord has, just how much planning he puts into everything that he makes. I think within the world that we live in, the things that we see, uh, I'm excited to find out just how much it is that we're missing. I mean, we, we are prayerfully considering, we are seeing what the Lord is doing, we are excited about all these things, but I know in my life, the things that have happened have had echoes for decades farther than I realized. Things that happened to me in my childhood shaped who I am and how I serve the Lord today. And God in his infinite wisdom always sought to make sure that we had a way to be connected to him. That as he created Eden, as he created that perfect place for us to live in a face-to-face -face relationship, recognizing that mistakes would be made, that we would choose to push away God, choose which is the basis of every sin, to put our own ideas ahead of what God wants for us. And in this time, we have separated ourselves from God. We have pushed against the Creator who only wants the best for us. And so God put a plan and dropped generations of hints for us. Gave us insight into moments and experiences that would be to come foretelling of Jesus and his arrival, foretelling of the coming of the Holy Spirit and all that that would be for us in how we live and how we breathe. And giving us information along the way so that we would be able to recognize when these events are taking place, when God's perfect redemption comes for us. And so Jesus came, so he lived a life that was without fault, that was full of wisdom and grace and compassion and love and truth in terms of what God wanted for the way in which we live in this world. And Jesus, having once again never sinned, never put his own ideas, perspectives, or heart above what God would ask, which would even lead to his own death, brutal death, death of what would be done to a criminal so that we could be healed, so that our brokenness could be fixed for us, which we don't have the ability to ourselves. And so on the night before Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. I imagine it was the bread that was on the table, the bread that had been a part of the entire meal. And he took it in his hands and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. So as you eat, Let's just take a moment, let's reflect, and let's give God a thankful heart for how much he has forethought to consider us.
the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Once again, I imagine it like a wooden cup, a cup that had been refilled so many times that evening. And in taking it, he gave meaning and symbolism to something that was seemingly unimportant. And isn't that what truly God does? He takes things out of mediocrity and makes them special. He redeems them. He makes them beautiful again. And in that moment, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which nobody in the room understood in that moment exactly what that would mean. And Jesus knew what would be coming. He knew what would take place next. And yet still he followed the Lord's plan for us. So as we take this, we're going to take a, a moment or two of reflection after we partake of the juice together. Ask the Lord to just speak into your heart this morning. Give him your attention and see what he has for you. It might be a word, it might be a phrase, it might be a picture. The Lord speaks through images. And I know so many of you, just like me, are a visual thinker. And let's just give the Lord just a couple minutes this morning of space for him to speak into our hearts. So with that, let's drink and let's reflect on all that the Lord has done. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for the great and mighty, wondrous work that you have done. Lord, continue to open our hearts, continue to allow us to hear all that you have for us. In your mighty and precious name, amen. So on Friday night, we had a uh, drive in Himsing in the parking lot, and it was great. And I got the opportunity to share a little bit with uh, those there about my life, where I've been, the things that I've experienced. And this morning, I thought I'd start off talking about Ashley, as all pastors' wives just desperately love and get excited about. When Ashley and I started dating, we were... Actually, we started hanging out excessively before we started to date. And we used to go to Tim Hortons after my Thursday night history of Christianity class, and we used to just hang out and have coffee. And one coffee would turn into two, which would turn into three, and then her father would call at 2.30 in the morning saying, are you coming home at some point? And she'd say, okay, sorry, I lost track of time, I'd come home. But one of the things that she decided to teach me during that time was, to how, to do, was how to do a Rubik's Cube. Now, the thing about a Rubik's Cube that is quite interesting is that it, uh, it has a very simple goal. The goal is obviously to make every side the exact same color. And I'll tell you, before Ashley and I started to spend uh, those excessive amounts of time together, we used to, well, I, I played with these for a few years, and frankly, I had only ever gotten one side done before. 
Now, Ashley, in taking this time, was patient, was gracious, was kind, because I was a fairly slow learner, I must say. What would happen is we'd get together and I would uh, get a few moves and get an idea of how to get another section done and I would go home since she let me take one of the Rubik's Cubes home and I would practice and I would get halfway through it and then I would forget what exactly the move was that I was supposed to do to get this one over here. And I would get really, really frustrated and go back to the next coffee and work a little harder and work a little harder and I, I started to figure out, okay, how you do a Rubik's Cube is you start with a single face, or at least the way, technique she taught me. Then you work to get that top layer all done. Then the middle layer all done. Then you would get the bottom corners all done. And then you would get two faces complete. And then you only have three left at the end of this. Now, I'm going to be honest, it took me like six months to even get that far in learning how to solve the Rubik's Cube. And there would be days where I would get so frustrated, I'd be like, you know, if I took this thing apart and put it back together, she would never know. She would never know. Of course she'd know. She would never know. And there would be times where I would get a move and then I would forget exactly how that move worked. And I'd get even more frustrated because it felt like two steps forward, one step back. So we'd go out the next time and we would learn and we would learn and the entire time the end goal was so clear and simple but the process how to get from here to there was so painful that I just some days wanted to give up, some days got entirely frustrated and just didn't want to do any of it anymore. But due to her patience and skill, I was able to finally accomplish the vision. The vision was obviously to have a complete Rubik's Cube, but the process of how to get there was what the journey was about and what the skills that needed to be developed needed to be around. And once again, that required lots of education, lots of patience that required learning things I didn't already know before. It required having setbacks and set forwards even though the goal was so clear, how to get there was a confusing, long education process that, once again, to do something seemingly so simple was so difficult. Now, I'm going to be honest, I kind of cheated today. I did part of it before we started because I didn't want that to turn into a 10-minute story, but I promise you I did it all myself. Frankly, when I think of Scripture and I think of the story of Nehemiah and his whole process of taking on the responsibility of rebuilding the walls, it relates so clearly to me of the experience that we have as believers. When we talk about what a vision is, what a mission statement is, what a practice is, those are very clear for us and very outlined within scripture in the most basic of terms possible. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Clear, straightforward, direct. Go forth and baptize all who once again have repented and believed and have declared truth in Jesus Christ and teach them all that I have commanded you. Very straightforward, very simple. These goals, these things that we are looking to accomplish are laid out for scripture for us in two basic sentences. Now, how we do that as a community, how we do that as a body is the real deep question that needs to be solved. How we would do that living in Canada is very different than how we would do that living in America. It's very different because the people are different, they think differently, they process differently. Now imagine jumping to another culture that's similar to ours, European, fairly multicultural, lots of different languages. Languages have nuances, the process and practice changes, let alone jumping into a third world country or down to the other end of the globe where now we're speaking to cultures with different values, different principles, different things that make them tick. But yet in each one of these circumstances, the goal is the exact same. How we accomplish our vision is about how we choose to accomplish those goals. And that choice is not something that we declare once and is done. We're going to do it this way. 
Every day it's going to change despite our circumstances, despite where we end up, and it's going to evolve as the world changes around us. I mean, pretty clearly, 18 months ago, when we all found out on a Friday that nobody was going out of their house on Monday, how we chose to engage people around those same biblical principles instantly changed overnight in a way that in our lifetimes, as far as I know, we've never had to think so deeply about. So when we jump back into the life of Nehemiah, when we jump back to 586 BC, we get a catastrophic event for the city of Jerusalem. It was sacked, it was overrun, it was destroyed and pillaged and looted and left as a ghost town. Eight years later, the first exiles, the first Jewish people that were displaced started to trickle back into that former city of beauty and prosperity and strength and nothing was the same. The closest thing I think we can picture is seeing those war zones from the Middle East where buildings have crumbled, where animals roam free, where everything is just entirely empty. And this is a total of 71 years from when the temple was completed to when these first exiles came back. Now when they came back, they came back once again to not the same thing that they left. Now, Nehemiah didn't come to Jerusalem with the goal of rebuilding the wall. He didn't necessarily wake up one day and just decide, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my skill set as a leader within the king's household. Nehemiah had the, goal, uh, the job of being the cupbearer to the king, tasting the food, looking over the security of the food, tasting it himself so it wasn't poisoned. It was a huge position of responsibility, of credibility, and one that had an overwhelming amount of trust in it. And that trust came with certain benefits, certain comforts. You need to be healthy to find out if everything else is healthy. So he lived in relatively large comfort. And so one day, he receives a vision from the Lord. He receives a picture from the Lord, a goal for the Lord. And that's where we start our passage in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted before the Lord God of heaven. In this moment, there is an, a problem that has been around for years. There is a situation that has not been solved for years. There is a city that is in desperate need because it's vulnerable. Walls were a sign of fortified strength. Walls were a sign of protection. And that protection forfeited you or gave you a certain lifestyle that you could keep because you were safe, because you had protection, because it meant there was a certain level of military strength and security. But the fact that the wall, after all this time, still is broken, speaks to something else, something actually quite haunting. It speaks to the complacency of the nation. They have started to move back into a city, and they do not see rebuilding of the walls as something of a very high priority. They have come back and gotten into comfort and they have gotten back and gotten into some sense of normalcy. And it's kind of like uh, when I finish my basement uh, and renovate it, I get it like 90%, 98% of the way there and it's like good enough. Yeah, the trim still needs to be caulked. Okay, the posts still need to go, but it's usable. It's, it's usable at this point. And thus, those last few things have been outstanding for about a year and a half now. But much like the nation, they don't have this motivation or desire to see these things accomplished. They have no motivation to get back to that place of security, but also that place of having all of these things built and dedicated towards the Lord. This not only speaks of a, a complacency about their lifestyle, but also about the value that they take in what God has given them. This, once again, is the land that God has given, the city that he has established. 
That was the promise of decades and generations. This was their inheritance. And it's okay if it's falling apart. It's not that important. They did the bare minimum to get what they needed and required to be comfortable enough to live their lives, letting all these things be outstanding. And how much of a broken mindset is that about doing what the Lord has asked of us? So the Lord places this burden on Nehemiah to see what could be done, to see what needs to be done to approach it in a way that nobody else has. And it starts with someone who sees the possibility of what it could look like. To see and have that picture in mind of what those walls would look like, how the gates could be rebuilt, and what that would do for the nation as a whole. And let's be honest, this is a fairly simple problem in terms of problem and goal. The walls need to be rebuilt, so just build walls. Once again, there are lots of people who had that skill set. It's not a problem that should have been left outstanding. It's not that there aren't the skills and gifts and ability to do it, but there's a lack of motivation and a lack of individuals who are willing to point towards the destination and say, this is where we want to go. Let's go there together. Now, his goal is not revolutionary, but the process he takes to accomplishing it is not only what's going to be unique about this whole story, but it's what actually leads him towards the success of accomplishing what God has laid on his heart. And so he left a position of responsibility. He left a position of comfort, of security, of not having a whole lot of problems to tackle something that had been not done for years to tackle something nobody else obviously had an interest in doing. And this commitment to his vision required a sacrifice of those things that were comfortable to accomplish something that could be great. Once again, he hasn't built these walls yet. There is no guarantee of the outcome. So he's stepping out in faith towards something that has the potential, not the guarantee, the potential to have benefit for the community. And he, although he has the picture, what is actually happening and what it's going to take to get there is not clear. Uh, I'm going to show you guys a picture of when we were in Ecuador. Um, and before we get that picture up, uh, just explain the context. We went to this little village uh, that was on a giant cliffside um, overlooking the ocean. And we see Logan playing on the playground, probably about from here to the foyer away. And he's walking across this thing really weird, and we can't figure out exactly why. So we go over to see what our six-year-old is doing, and this is what we find. There used to be a bridge there between those hand railings. And although you can't see it, that's about a nine-foot drop straight down onto solid concrete. Now, if you look on the right side of the picture, you can kind of see the railing off in the distance. That is the only railing on that peak, and the rest is just sheer cliff drop-off down to the ocean. And we get over there, and we're like, oh my goodness, what does he get down? You're going to fall, you're going to break their neck. And we look around, and apparently in Ecuador, only the strong children survived because nobody else was concerned about what was going on. So we're like, okay, you can't do the bridge thing anymore. You got to chill and just keep yourself under control. Just play on this side. But talk about once again, oh yeah, he's playing on the playground. He's crossing a bridge. He's doing it in his own weird way, having no concept of what's actually taking place and what the risk actually is in him trying to get through this bridge. And as I think about that, and as I think about that story, I think to myself, yeah, once again, the goal can be so clear. But how we get there can be such a challenge. God has a clear destination and vision for us. But our vision is all about how we look to accomplish it. What specifically are we going to do? How will we do it? And for us within our life, within this shifting community and uh, restriction that is Canada and Ontario, that goal has remained unchanged. 
but how open we are to receiving from the Lord what we need to do and what we need to do differently will shape whether or not we get to see the glory of what God is building. And for us, we need to pray for these opportunities, but most importantly, plan as if they are going to be accomplished. We need to have a picture in our mind and prepare as if we are going to see and experience the goal. I think all too often there's, there's a tension we have in our hearts of wanting to prepare appropriately for the blessing but not wanting to waste people's energy and effort. I know even in terms of um, our drive-in service on Friday night, how many ice cream bars should we buy? Do we buy 20? Do we buy 50? Do we buy 100? Well, they're cheap enough, so we bought 100. We did not expect 100 people. We had about 35 people there, which was beautiful and awesome. And I think Riley had about four popsicles by the time Ray figured out what was going on. But once again, we prepare as if we are going to be successful, and then we celebrate what we actually get to partake and accomplish. And it's hard because when we have our own ideas of what the expected outcome should be, we tend to get tunnel vision towards that. And I know, especially in North America, the success, is it, is it numbers or is it uh, the experience? Is it uh, how many kids come to our program or is it how deep the relationships become? Both metrics of success have value, but we need to be open to having our own perspective of what success is shifted ever so slightly. And I think that's where we have to ask ourselves the question, are we open to what God is trying to show us? God is a creator. He is doing things differently. He is making something that we have never seen before. If God is just doing the same thing over and over for the same results, he doesn't actually need us in that equation. He doesn't actually want us to join in that equation. And the same thing, if we are doing the exact same practice and the exact same programs in the exact same way, at some point or another, we have stopped listening to God because we've stopped giving him the opportunity to shape and direct and just push us into a different direction. So I think we need to be open to different. We need to be open to new. We need to be open to a way that we did not expect. And I think within life, there are two ways that change happens. The first is catastrophic immediate change. We have an earthquake level event in terms of change. It happens suddenly, immediately, without warning, and there is little control that we have aside from navigating the landscape after the fact. And the other is, I think, in terms of a gradual passage of change. I picture a floating iceberg. God uses both of those, and we see both of those within Scripture. And within our own ways, we struggle with both of those. We don't like fast change because it catches us off guard, we're unprepared, and it's too much too fast. We don't like slow change because either sometimes we fight the change because we don't see the goal or the why it needs to, or it's just so frustrating because it's not happening the way we want it to, or we're not seeing the outcome as quickly as we feel that we should. But once again, God uses both in their own timings and in their own ways. And the heart that we need to have is a disposition to not let our own expectations hold us back from seeing what God is doing. Because the reality is change is never an immediate thing when we want it. Change has a time and place and process. And even for Nehemiah, when he received this vision, which was clear, rebuild the walls, the work actually didn't begin immediately. I'm going to show you a picture of a calendar here which lines up the Jewish calendar and the months with our English calendar that we would recognize. Now, when Nehemiah first got this vision from God, it was in the month of... Kislev, which is in about November, December of our calendar. He waited until the month of Nisan, March or April, about six months before he even voiced his vision, before he even shared it with the king 
and asked him for the freedom to step out of his role to do it. The goal was clear, build the walls. It took him six months to process and ready himself to start the initial, initial, pre, pre, pre phases to do what the Lord had asked him. And I say this not because I'm saying every change that we do is going to take six months, but I say it because often, and especially in this part of the world with our on-demand Netflix, with our drive through experience, with our Amazon Prime shipping, the pressure for things to be immediate is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And I think we are translating this expectation of now and right now and immediate into everything that we do for the Lord. We should see an outcome immediately. We should see these things happen right now. And there will be things that happen catastrophic earthquake style that could be very positive in terms of their outcome. But we also need to learn to be patient to let the Lord speak and guide in this process. And even then, when Nehemiah first started to do the work on the wall, the first thing he did was a survey tour. The wall is broken. He could have gone to a section of wall and started fixing it. But instead, he decided to do a survey tour around the entire city to ascertain the, case, the needs of the entire goal at the same time. And I think even post-COVID, as we've been talking as a church and as people have been asking us about what programs are going to get going well, we're, we're doing the surveys. And that is a part of our survey seeing what do people, in terms of ministries, what are they excited and passionate about, about getting started again? We are in this survey also of seeing what the government is saying we can do this week, which will change next week, and seemingly everything's looking blue skies and green grass moving forward, and uh, we're excited about that. But we're taking time and care to make sure what we do ends up in terms of moving us in the right direction, however fast or slow that it does. But it's important to remember that vision, although the goal stays the same, vision is something that gets refined over time. And in terms of this, Nehemiah's vision could have been something as simple as rebuilding the walls, but how he does that is going to be something that just gets, ends up getting clearer and clearer and clearer as time goes on. And so we get to Nehemiah 3, verses 1 to 3, where we start getting a glimpse into this process. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work to rebuild the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zachar, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hanaseh. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. At least six gates are named in this process of rebuilding the wall. And actually, these gates are the first things that they actually started to construct. Well, wait a second. Wasn't, wasn't the entire goal to rebuild the walls? Shouldn't we be starting with the walls first? Isn't isn't the walls what end up protecting the access points and the gates are just what control the flow of traffic? There would have been so many reasons as to why people wouldn't have appreciated or wouldn't have thought that this was the best way to do it. But remember, first Nehemiah received the vision. He resourced what was required. He surveyed what the needs were. And then he chose a place to start, which was the gates, and then they moved on to the towers, and actually the last thing that they built were the walls themselves. I mean, that seems so backwards in terms of the whole process of, of building security. But the walls were actually the last thing. For someone who got really excited that the wall was going to get built beside their house because that's where they lived, can you imagine how annoying and frustrating that must have been? You hear you're getting a new wall, and now it seems like everybody is doing everything else except that wall. And you're the last one to get what you wanted in the first place. But Nehemiah's vision and process is about so much more. It's about controlling the flow of people, creating security and checkpoints. Not everyone's coming in from every corner of the city. There are natural roads that lead to these gates first. And those are the most reasonable places to enter. So by doing this, he's creating 
the security that is required along with moving towards that whole process. But let's be honest, the first draft of Nehemiah's plans probably didn't work out. I remember in high school shop class, we used to have to draw diagrams of everything and then build our projects. And my final project often looked better, I'll say better, but nothing like my original plans. And we'd get marked on the plans, so I'd just like measure the coffee table that I made twice the size of the one that I visioned, and then redraw the demographics, the, the whole diagrams, and give those in. And I'd get a really good grade because they matched. Uh, I don't know how they didn't see that coming. Um, but once again, in all those building projects, it's not that what I built ended up being bad in comparison to what I decided, but as I was building that coffee table, I thought to myself, an oval table is going to be impossible to make perfect for my 14-year-old self. Let's just do a square table. I'd like to build this, and I joke you not, I measured the size of that table by how many pizza boxes I could fit on it. So I got three large pizza boxes, and that was the exact square footage area of what that table ended up being, that the process ended up getting refined and changed and developed as I went along, making the how so much clearer along the way. And I say that because often when people give us an answer to a problem, uh, we latch on to that answer. It's our nature. We love solutions. We love clarity. And we need to be open to what that answer is to change and grow and shift along the journey that we take. We need to be open to the fact that God is teaching us something new and changing the way in which we see the world around us continually. I mean, the whole process of sanctification, of learning something new, continuing to shape our character like Jesus, that's a growth and change. So we need to have a clear way of knowing what it is the goal is, but recognizing the process is okay to change. And although I have one strategy of how I do a Rubik's Cube, um, there are many different ways to do it. The way I've learned is only simply one of the many ways to get towards that goal. And I think this is where we have the potential within what we're trying, looking towards what God is doing to get really frustrated. Frustrated because we like clarity, we like process, we like answers that we can follow like a roadmap or GPS that doesn't tell us to turn left into a pond. We like things to be direct and clear and lead us in as linear and straight as fashion to get us towards the thing that we think will be great, the thing that the Lord is telling us. And there's an aspect where we negotiate in our own minds what God should and should not do. Well, of course, why wouldn't God want every single seat in this sanctuary to be filled next Sunday? Why wouldn't he want that? That would bring him glory. But the process and journey that God is leading us is one for us to grow and experience through towards that. But how we do it will shape how the message is received. And before we get too upset, we need to make sure that we have our own expectations under a little bit of check, but also take the time to measure and survey where did we start? What did we decide to do? And what are we accomplishing right now? And to see the change that we've made, to see whether it's two new people next Sunday or one more kid at our program, to celebrate the successes, no matter how small they may be. To celebrate the fact that God is doing something, that lives are being changed, that relationships are becoming whole again. And we can't allow ourselves to be frustrated or overwhelmed by what we see other people doing because let's be honest, they are not us. When we talk about what our vision is as a church, our vision should be unique to who is in this room and who is watching online. Our vision should not be the same as Into One or Stovall Pentecostal Church or Springvale because we are not Springvale, Stovall Pentecostal. We are a community that the Lord has built together and has drawn people into, including you and including you watching online. So the how of what we need to do needs to reflect who we are and the way that the Lord has equipped and developed us. And that's why when it comes to a vision, a vision needs to be personal. Because regardless of what church you go to, regardless of what corner you go to, the mission 
Go forth and make disciples of all nations. Love the Lord God and love your neighbor as yourself. The mission is the same. The vision is contextual. A vision is not about what we will do. It's about how we will do it. Not what, but how. And if we can come into this in a way that we take into account who we are, where we are, and answer that question of how, we're going to make something as a community that we get excited about. Because it's us. Because it's our DNA. Because it's the things that the Lord has equipped and skilled us to do. And because, once again, that mission has been so clearly laid out by God, because we have taken into account all these things, the process of how we do it will be unique to who we are. If the Lord had given this mission to somebody else to rebuild the walls, likely we would have had a very different story. The timeline would have been different. It may have taken longer. It may have taken shorter. They may have started with the stones rather than the gates. And all of that is okay for that to be different. So long as, once again, we have our eyes on God and what He is leading us to do, and we are looking to do it out of who He has built us into, not the way we saw somebody else do it that worked somewhere else. And so within this, as we look at our community, we recognize that there is space for all. As the worship team comes forward, we need to remind ourselves that the Lord has built a community and a family through this church. And that family is a place that welcomes all, regardless of where you have come from, where you are going, whether you are here for a little bit or whether you have been here for a long time. The community that the Lord has made is open to anybody who would seek to know him. And as you seek to know him, he changes you and builds you and continues to do so. I really hope when I am in my later stages of life that I'm still open to hearing what God would have. I remember in my university sitting next to a woman who was 84 years old taking a history of Christianity class because she just wanted to learn more about who her Savior was. And when she found out she could audit and not do the papers, she was even more excited. But the idea, once again, that God has created an open door and an open community and that we seek to reflect and embody that same thing. So for you this morning, whether once again you have... Uh, been around uh, and in a relationship with Christ your entire life, or whether this whole concept of community and accomplishing a purpose greater than yourself is brand new, I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes and pray with me to give God the space he needs to shape and teach and to lead you towards that mission, but lead you in a way that builds off your strengths and giftedness as an individual and as a community. If you just bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Father God, I can't do any of this on my own. Lord, I need you in my life to help me see the big picture, to help me see how I fit into that. And Lord, I want to give you that opportunity to change my heart to change who I am and to strengthen me into who you would have me be. Lord, we, we know where we are going. We don't know how exactly we will get there. But that's where we are open to receiving from you. Lord, as we come to you in this time, we ask that you would lay your heart on our shoulders. Let us receive the how, like Nehemiah did, for a challenge that has been there for decades. And Lord, may we just, once again, give you the space in our hearts that you would need so that we could hear and see. In your name we pray, amen. Now, if that is your first time praying a prayer of willingness, a prayer of openness to God like that, then you are now a part of that family.
This is now a community and family that belongs to you, and we encourage you to reach out for us. Uh, reach out to us, and we have a gift for you uh, to once again help you in your journey, and we are excited to welcome you to the family of God. And if, once again, you are somebody who has been following the Lord for all your life, may that prayer just be one like you have prayed hopefully many times before of giving the Lord space, giving the Lord a moment, and giving the Lord the opportunity to speak into your heart. So with that, we're going to head back over to a time of worship, and we're going to once again give the Lord an opportunity. I invite you to stand and let's praise the Lord together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His heart. As you go this week, may you have confidence in the fact that God is building, God is moving, God is working. And may you just approach Him and come to Him with a new or renewed or even just excited 
readiness to see and partake and participate in all that he is building. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you safe and guide you through this coming week. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for watching, and the Lord bless you.